Part 2, Chapter 22 Mike walked into the paneled room that reminded him of Aunt Amy's library. At the front, a seven-person jury sat behind a long table, each with a pencil and paper. The Women's Auxiliary Volunteer introduced the judges. The director of the city orchestra, the director of the community chorus, the Philadelphia Enquirer music career critic, a councilman, the owner of a local theater, the mayor of Philadelphia, and Albert N. Hoxie. Hoxie was dressed in a band uniform. Stout and full-cheeked, with wavy hair combed straight back, he looked like a model of kind authority. You are Michael Flannery? Yes, sir. Well then, son, we look forward to hearing what you can do. Good luck. You may begin whenever you're ready. Mike raised the harmonica and began his set piece. He played it just as Aunt Uni had taught him, with no improvising and as technically perfect as he could. When he finished, he paused for a moment, looked at each judge, and then began America the Beautiful. He played the first verse nice and slow, like a lullaby. The second verse was the blues version that, with trills and chords and blended notes, it wasn't hard for Mike to drop them into the music and testify to the journey he'd been on. His eyes closed and he traveled back, arriving on Amarillis Drive, riding in the wagon with Mouse, lying on his cot in the dormitory and staring at the wrinkled paint on the ceiling, standing at Granny's window, waiting, and listening to his mother sing to him and Frankie. He played the third verse like he and Frankie used to play it, the refrain sounding like a storm crashing up to the seas to shot to shining sea part where he slowed down the notes calm and simple clear and sweet but when he finally lowered the harmonica and looked up the judges stared at him awkwardly mike shifted from one foot to the other had he played poorly several of the judges cleared their throats then they all began to scribble on their pads mr hoxie stood came around the table and shook mike's hand thank you michael that was a very impressive performance you can pick up your tickets for the concert tomorrow night on your way out, and you'll receive a letter with the results of the competition next week. Good luck to you. You are a very promising candidate. Mike blushed, but this time with pride. Thank you, sir. When they arrived home, Mr. and Mrs. Potter were waiting for them in the kitchen with a cake. To celebrate, said Aunt Uni. We don't even know if Mike made it, said Frankie. When I was a girl, said Aunt Uni, my father insisted on cake after big auditions and before the results. He said cake should be as much for trying as for anything else. Mr. Howard looked at her and smiled. If cake is for trying, then you deserve it too, Uni. She smiled back at him. Mr. Howard rubbed his hands together. You're in for a treat, boys. Mrs. Potter makes a delicious chocolate fudge layer. That she does, said Mr. Potter. Mrs. Potter put a wedge in front of Frankie. Wow, he said. What does Mike get if he makes the band? Mike blurted. I get to start practicing again, right, Auntie? Auntie? Frank, Frankie giggled. Auntie? They all laughed. Mike felt his cheeks flush. The word had just slipped out. Had she minded? He glanced at her and she gave him a small smile and nodded as if everything was as it should be. Make the band or not, he'd be leaving them all soon. Mike concentrated on his cake, taking in a big, big bite so he could think about anything but his feelings. He glanced at each of them. Mr. Howard reached over and brushed cake crumbs from my uni sleeve. She took a napkin and dabbed at Frankie's frosting smudged cheek. Frankie looked at Mike and smiled with chocolate-coated teeth. Mr. and Mrs. Potter laughed at Frankie's antics. Mike took it all in. The kitchen, the laughter, the smell of chocolate cake that had been made for trying. He closed his eyes, hoping to capture this moment so he'd always remember when and where he had once belonged.